Okay, Ephesians. Uh, we might get to chapter 6 in Terry's 40 weeks. We'll see. I, you know, I, we're going to see. I will see. Let me pick up where I was a couple weeks ago, give you a little, uh, bring us back to the context a little bit. Chapter 5, verse 21 is a transition to the discussion of relationships in the ancient world where you'd have, you'd have spouses, children, and you'd have slaves. And so Paul turns his attention there to discuss that. And in chapter 5, verses 22 to 24, the wives are told to submit to the leadership right that God and his sovereignty has bestowed on the husband. Okay, and this is uh, something our society doesn't like to hear. And I remember some years ago the, there was something where the, the Association of Baptist Churches, I don't remember the proper name of the group, they came out and said, yes, that, that a wife was to submit to the leadership of her husband, and that you know, caused all kinds of editorials and everything, what pinheads these people were and all that kind of thing. But it's what Scripture teaches, and so we see that in 522 through 24 and in other places. In this marriage partnership of two spiritually equal persons, a man and a woman, as I said two weeks ago, you've got to specify that these days. But in this marriage partnership of two spiritually equal persons, the man bears the primary sp- responsibility to lead the partnership in a God-glorifying direction. Okay, God has given this role, this responsibility, this burden, if you will. He has put that on the husband. Okay, now, that doesn't mean that the wife is inferior to, less worthy, or less capable than her husband. I stressed that a couple weeks ago. Because as soon as you say that the husband has a leadership role, everybody freaks out and says, oh, you're saying the wife's dirt. She's worthless. She's an idiot. Okay, not at all. All right, not at all. It is simply that God has given different roles to husbands and to wives. It also doesn't mean that wives are to cower silently. This caricature of Christian husbands that our society likes to blow out there to try to, you know, get people away from Christianity. They've got this guy out here, and I don't doubt that there are instances where this happens, but it is not the norm. It shouldn't happen at all where the husband is sitting here and he's just this blowhard who thinks he can just, you know, uh, treat his wife like she's a dog and just boss her. And and, and her function is to sit here and go, yes, oh, master. You know, not to, that is not what is meant by the submission. She's not to, you know, just cower silently saying, yes, oh, great one. She is a non-leading partner, and she is called to use her gifts and her abilities and her intellect to bless her husband and the family, and that will require her many times to instruct, advise, correct her husband. That's how she blesses him. She doesn't let him walk off a cliff because she says, well, I'm going to submit to you there. See you, dear. Okay, so it's not, it's not that kind of thing. And it, Okay, now, when all is said and done, the responsibility for leadership is on the husband, and he has to choose the course that he thinks is best. He doesn't do it high-handedly. He doesn't do it because he sits there and says, you know, anything you think is worthless. He does it because he has the burden of responsibility of leading, and he must, in the end, choose the course he thinks is best and wisest. And the wife is called to support that, to submit to it, not to resent it, not to sabotage it, not to say, I'm going to get you. I'll show you I was actually right and you're an idiot. Okay? None of that. And that's how, that, that's how, it, how it is. Now, that's the wife in 522.24. The wife is called to submit to the leadership responsibility of her husband. When we ended two weeks ago, we were looking at 525-32. through 32. Husbands... Love the wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing of the water with a word, that he might present the church to himself as glorious without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but in order that she might be holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ also does the church, For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and to the church. In any case, you also, one by one, let let each love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she fears the husband. Okay, rather than instructing husbands to rule the wives, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, 
You, you know, first century audience may be thinking, since he said wives submit to the husband, that the instruction to the husband would be to rule the wives, but he tells the husbands, love your wives. He commands husbands to love their wives. And that's why I said I have little patience with this. I'm like, I, I just never really loved you. We don't understand what biblical love is. It is not simply a feeling of affection or warmth. It is a commitment. It is a commitment to the welfare of another person, a sacrificial commitment. I will give my life to bless you. You understand that with your kids. I've, I've mentioned that many times. You understand with your kids. They might upset you, cause you to pull your hair out. What little is that? And, you know, but yet you understand that you remain devoted to them where you work in their lives for their welfare, their good, their blessing. And all of this in a marriage takes place in a context of natural affection and sexual intimacy. But he instructs them that, that listen, you're to love your wives, and they're to love their wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for. That's pretty high calling. That's how you're to love your wives. Husbands, I'm commanding you, Paul says, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Woo! Now, where's there room in that for this caricature of Christian husbands? As this lout who sits around and just bosses his wife around saying, hey, this is a great deal. I've got a servant. Where is that? Okay, but you see, the way this works, when we get to chapter 6, there are forces that are behind this. Okay, that's how well, you put this out in society. Why? Because it scares people off Christianity. They think they know Christianity. Ah, I know about Christianity. You guys are, you know, all you guys sit around and you, you just think, here, this is great. I have a slave for a wife and that's wonderful and blah, blah. Okay, you see the commitment, the sacrifice that a husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And having spoken of Christ's love for the church, he elaborates on the purpose of Christ's love for the church, not intending that as part of the husband's responsibility for the wife. He says that the purpose of his love for the church, which love is expressed supremely in Christ's dying, the purpose of that love, he says, is to sanctify her, to present the church to himself as glorious without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and to make the church holy and blameless. And we went through that two weeks ago. Okay, so this is the, he gives the purpose of Christ's love for the church in the same way as Christ, who loves the church as his body, in the same way as Christ, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Now that's bringing it home. Love your own wife as your own body. Guys, you know we love our bodies, right? I mean, something happens to, we're very, you know, very solicitous of our bodies. We're very concerned. Want to know, is it, you know, What's good for it? And so he says, love your wives as your own bodies. The husband's love for his wife is to be the kind that cares for her needs and facilitates her growth and development. That's what we do with our bodies. We feed it, take care of it, you know, really good to our own bodies, and we seek its growth and its development. And that's what he says, how you're to be towards your, how you're to be towards your, your wife. I mean, after all, no one ever hated his own flesh. Instead, he nourishes and cherishes it. One nourishes and cherishes one's own body as, as Christ also nourishes and cherishes the church. He says, for we are members of his body. Now, there is an intimate union. You see this picture here. There is an intimate union between Christ and the church, between Christ and disciples. It is not this distant, aloof thing. There is an intimate union between Christ and the church. Because he says, for we are members of his body. We're members of his body. Paul elaborates then on, this, on the Christ-church relationship by citing Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, this formula. He, he, I mean, he cites the 2.24 without any formula introducing a citation. He doesn't do it by saying, as it says... As is written, it is written, it says. He simply goes right into the text. Okay? He simply goes right into the text with its opening words of 224 for this reason. 
And what is the, the immediate antecedent of that in Ephesians is that for we are members of his body for this reason. Okay, for we are members of his body for this reason. And it seems that he's saying, he's saying that because we are members of Christ's body, for that reason, because we're members of Christ's body, men and women unite in the one flesh relationship of marriage. That seems to be what he's saying. And if that's the case, he's saying that marriage was instituted in part to serve as a type of Christ's relationship with the church. That was what God had in mind, at least in part, when he instituted marriage, was that it was to serve as a type for Christ's relationship with the church. Now that puts marriage in just a whole different thing, doesn't it? It is the type of which the, the anti-type is Christ's relationship with the church. O'Brien, he says, indeed it was God's intention from the beginning when he instituted marriage to picture the relationship between Christ and his redeemed people. Husbands and wives, listen to that. Listen to this responsibility that we have been given in marriage to what? We are to picture Christ's relationship with the church. That's pretty high calling. That's a pretty high calling. He says, this mystery is great or profound, and then he clarifies that the mystery to which he's referring is Christ's relationship with the church. Okay, that's the mystery to which he's referring. The mystery of Christ's relationship with the church is another aspect of the one grand mystery God has now revealed in Christ, and it is that mystery of which marriage, you know, the intimate union of marriage is a type. Okay, so he's talking about this mystery of Christ's relationship with the church, that mystery being part of that one grand mystery that God has now revealed. Okay, so it's part of that, and that mystery, it's that mystery of which the intimate union of marriage is to be a type. Here's what Andrew Lincoln says on this idea, and I think it's, he says, both the OT passage and the marriage relationship of which that OT passage, Genesis 2.24, speaks are connected with the mystery. But their connection is that they point to the secret that has now been revealed, that of the relationship between Christ and the church. The relationship between Christ and the church is one of intimacy. It is one of union. It is this close, tremendous relationship. The relationship of husband and wife, that one, fle one flesh intimacy, that union, there is no greater relationship among humans. And he says, that's Christ's relationship with the church. Wow. That's his relationship with the church. Peter O'Brien, he adds, he says, the mystery is not any particular marriage or marriage itself. It is the union of Christ and the church, which is reflected in a truly Christian marriage. Such a mystery is indeed profound. And it is profound if we grasp the idea, the depth of this union that he's speaking about. Now, as an intended type for Christ's relationship with the church, Christian marriage is to live up to that role. Right? I mean, we understand that marriage is instituted as a, as a type for Christ's relationship with the church, so that has an effect on how we're to conduct ourselves within that relationship. Our relationship is to reflect Christ's loving relationship with the church. So you see, marriage is a type for Christ's relationship with the church, and Christ's relationship with the church then sets the standard, see, for how the, how the marriage is to function as a type. It is a type of Christ's relationship with the church, and then we see Christ's relationship with the church, and we see how we are to function then as a type of that. So it is an awful high calling. I get tired of seeing Christian marriages run down, and denigrated, and as I said two weeks ago, it ought to be that everybody would say, I would rather have a Christian husband and a Christian wife than anything. Than anything. Okay? And your, your wife, husband, ought to be able to say that. I am so thankful that my husband is a Christian. You see, before he was a Christian, I don't know where he was going or what would have happened. But I'm so thankful he's a Christian. And the same thing, same thing for husbands to say that about their, about their wives. Well, the bottom line, he gives the bottom line in verse 33. 
is that even if one doesn't grasp the full import of marriage's relationship to Christ and the church, even if you don't get all the nuances, you don't grasp the full import of what is going on there, okay, the bottom line is that husbands are to love their wives as himself. He says, in any case, you also, one by one, let each love his own wife as himself. Let it sink in, guys. As himself. Okay? What are you seeking to do with yourself? You, you take great care of yourself, I'm telling you. You care about yourself a lot, if you're anything like I am. You know? Anything. And so he says, love your wife as yourself. You're devoted to her. Giving to her. Seeking to bless her. And he says, and let the wife see that she fears or respects the husband. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Reminds me of that Seinfeld thing years ago where Jerry's dating this girl. I don't know if you ever watched Seinfeld. He's dating this girl and she says, I saw your act. I can't respect anybody who does that. And he says, well, you're a cashier. I mean, you know, he was, he was, uh, but you see this idea, husband, wives are to respect their husband. I'm not going to do that. Well, you're told to do it. You're told, I, you know, I didn't, tell you, you're told to do it. Okay. So you see, you know, the husband sitting there saying, I'm not going to love my wife. Well, you're told to do it. That's crazy. Nobody can do that. Then you don't understand what he's commanding you. Wives, if you're saying that you don't understand what he's commanding, he's commanding you to respect your husband. Okay? Not to talk about your husband like he's dirt. You're to respect your husband. And if you're having problems with that, you need to work on it. Husbands, you're having problems with that, you need to work on that. Or repent, as we would say. Okay, chapter 6. So you made chapter 6. I don't know how many weeks it's been, but uh, you notice I changed that in the introduction thing there. You notice I slipped it over to January 2010. All right, that's all right. I just keep moving the stuff. You see, it doesn't matter. I just move it. All right, chapter 6, 1 through 3. <clears throat> so we've had husbands and wives. He talks about wife uh, submitting to the husband. And then he comes and he gives the husband's responsibility to the wife. Well, now he talks to children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. See, the children are commanded to obey their parents as an element of their Christian discipleship. They are to obey them in the Lord, meaning as an aspect of their, the children's, being in the Lord. You see this phrase, in the Lord, it comes in maybe half a dozen places in Ephesians. But he's telling them as an element of their Christian discipleship, they are to obey their parents. And this parallels, see, the motivation of the wife's submission, where he says that is as to the Lord. When we get to the slaves, you'll say, as to Christ. Well, here, they are to do this as an element of their Christian discipleship. Now, Romans chapter 1, verse 30, disobedience to parents is cited as a sign of what? Gentile depravity. Okay, it's a sign of Gentile depravity. 2 Timothy 3, 2, it's cited as a sign of the evil of the last days. Now, I have to say, again, you know, I, I, I comment a lot on the society and all that, but this is just how stuff looks to me. We have a, a whole culture that seems to me, in addition to being sex-crazed and trying to tell everybody and his brother that the essence of life is how many people you can bed, okay, but we have this whole idea, but we also have this whole thing that parents are a joke. Okay, all of these shows, fathers particularly. you got shows on there, father's up there, what's he? He's a clod. He's the, who, who knows stuff? Well, the kids always know everything. You see, and there is this, this rebellion that is fostered and a disrespect for parents in our society that we just take. And the kids grow up thinking it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine to treat my parents that way, to disobey them, to talk about them in any way I want. And it's not. You see, it's not. Children, you're to obey your parents. Of course, there are none of them in here. <laughs> but you're to obey your parents. This is God saying to you, I don't want to do that. Well, hey. He commands husbands, he commands wives, he'll command masters, he'll command slaves, and he's commanding children. And since when did it become, I don't want to do that? Okay, I know you don't want to do it. 
then you grab yourself and you do it, right? Isn't that what it means to be a disciple of Jesus? I mean, you know, I don't want to do it. A lot of stuff I don't want to do. I'm sorry, that's how it is with me. You know, I just may have a longer way to go than you. But there's a lot of stuff I don't want to do, but you just say, I'm going to do it. Why? Because my Lord called me to do it. Children, that's how it is. And so all of this stuff, see, you know, all these shows come out. Everything's about, if you want to be humorous, it's about a dysfunctional family. You see? And I'm telling you, this stuff just gets sucked up in the society. And kids in our society and parents in our society need to understand this. Okay? It is that children are to obey their parents and to honor their father and mother. It's not a trivial thing. It's an important thing. Okay, now this term here, he says the term child, it's technon, it primarily demote, denotes relationship rather than age, and it can be used of adults. And the context here, it suggests that these children, they were old enough to be conscious of their relationship with the Lord and to be appealed to on the basis of that relationship. Okay, that's this idea in the Lord, obey your parents in the Lord. They are old enough to be aware of their relationship with Christ and to be appealed to on the basis of that relationship, but they're still young enough to be in the process of being brought up. You see that in verse 4. Okay, so there's an, uh, an older commentator, a guy named C.L. Mitten, that Lincoln quotes. He says, this exhortation, quote, could only refer to older children, perhaps what we should call teenagers, who were of an age to make a personal commitment to Christ, but still young enough to be living at home with their parents. So that's who he's aiming this at. Particularly in our society, I just say, listen up. You see? Because you get old, you know, you start to be 12, 13, 14, 15, whatever, and you think, you know, you hung the, hung the moon, and your parents are morons, and you don't have to respect them and treat them properly, and it's not right. It is not right. So Paul says that, and then in fact he says, Obeying them, he says, for this is right. He appeals to them on the basis not only of their Christian commitment, not only because they are in the Lord, but he also just says, for this is right. And this was a, this was a, a common practice. Stoics, for example, would use this technique. It was a common practice to appeal to what was generally recognized as right. So he tells them, do it on the basis of your Christian commitment. Do it because it's right. He tells them to do it because it's right, and then he reinforces his command by an appeal to Scripture. He cites the fifth of the Ten Commandments from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. And when we're talking about the law, how I went through all that stuff about there are elements you see embedded within the covenant that have ongoing validity. Well, here you see him appealing. He appeals to the Ten Commandments. How can that be? Well, it can be because of the way I tried to explain it to you. Okay, well, he appeals to the fifth of the Ten Commandments there in Deuteronomy 5.16, and he notes that this is the first commandment with a promise, and then he gives the promise to emphasize its importance, not necessarily meaning that the promise is applicable in their context. That doesn't have to follow from the fact he gives the promise, but on the other hand, he may be applying the promise to their context in the sense that, as a general rule, those who obey the instructions of godly parents are blessed and that it goes well with you and you live long. That's, remember, right out of Proverbs. Some of you may not have been in here for Proverbs. But right, what's the thing in Proverbs? He keeps saying, listen to me, listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. Listen to me and it'll, you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. It'll go well, it'll go well. All right, well, that's true, generally, right? I mean, you could get hit by a truck. We understand that. But basically, generally, you heed the instructions of godly parents and you're going to be blessed by it. Okay, it will go well with you. But this is just a big thing. It's, a big, it's one of these things that we just sit here and we talk about. We talk about, but we don't get down to dealing with and having children take this seriously. You know, I sometimes feel like if you tried to press this on kids today, you'd have an uprising. you got no right to do that. Who are you? You're only my parent. You're only the one who brought me into this world and provided for me and blessed me and gave to me. Who are you? Well, I'm your parent. I'm your parent. Then he says in verse 4, okay, wives, husbands, then he gives husbands duty to wives. Children, parents, now he's going to give parents duties to the children. He says, and fathers, do not make your children angry, 
but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. See, fathers are commanded not to make them angry, but to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And fathers are specifically addressed because as the head of the household, they have the primary responsibility for training the children. They are the leader of the household, but what's said to them naturally applies to mothers as well. Okay, so you don't sit there, mothers, you don't sit there and say, well, that speaks to fathers. Okay, it speaks to fathers in their capacity as the head of the household. It's going to apply to mothers in their training of the children and in their treatment of the children. He says that parents are not to provoke anger, meaning justifiable anger. Justifiable anger. Okay, you may, you may properly discipline a child and he gets angry. That's not the anger he's talking about. He's talking about you are not to provoke justifiable anger in your children. Now, this rules out excessively severe discipline. Okay? Excessively severe discipline. Discipline's fine. Discipline's proper. Discipline is a means of blessing a child. But what's our society do? Because of this spiritual war, parent spanks a kid on the fanny. Oh! He's abusing the child. No, he's not. He's teaching the child. Training the child. But see, our society will say... That Bible stuff, we're going to, at every opportunity, try to convince people that that's baloney. Oh, the Bible sanctions child abuse, you see. Don't go for it. Don't fall for this stuff. Okay? But it does rule out excessively severe discipline. You know the difference, right? You know when you are disciplining your child, spanking your child to bless the child, and then from somebody who goes off the deep end and they're chaining the kid up, starving the kid. Okay, you know the difference. Okay, they try to blur that stuff. But it rules out this excessively severe discipline. It rules out unreasonably harsh demands. It rules out an abuse of authority, arbitrariness in subjecting a child to humiliation. Come on, what what parent? (laughs) You know, I'm talking about a normal, healthy parent, right? You don't want to treat your kid this way. Subject a child to humiliation. You know, as you're taking out stuff from your life on your kid? No. See, Christians, no. (laughs) Right? That's not how we operate, not how we are to operate. Don't subject a child to humiliation. All forms of gross insensitivity to a child's needs and sensibilities. Okay, so this idea of parents, you have something here that you're not to provoke in your child this justice. You are not to mistreat your children. So that they have standing before God to sit here and say, look how he's treating me. You ought to be ashamed if that's true. Okay? Ashamed and change. See, what I love about Christianity is when God puts his finger on something in your life, you just say, forgive me, and you change and you set your course. If you've been acting this way, you know, don't deny it. Don't try to hide it from yourself. Oh, that's not me. That's not me. Take the word of God in. Breathe it in. Let it cut you. And then change. And be blessed in that process. Okay, he says here that, that you know, positively fathers are to supply their children with Christian instruction. Dads, you need to be seeing that this is happening with your kids because as I've said ad nauseum, we are in a sea that is hostile to the Christian faith. We are in a cultural tide. And if you're not teaching your child, seeing that your child is instructed, and I'm not simply talking about dropping the child off on Sunday and leaving it to the folks here. If your child does not see in you a bona fide faith, a genuine faith, where you pray about things, where when something happens, if you do wrong, you confess your sin... If your child sees that this is kind of an add-on to your life, this isn't really what drives my life. This isn't where my life is centered. If your child sees that my life is all about all of these other activities, yeah, but I go to church every now and then. What do you think the kids, they're very tuned into this stuff. They see it's a scam. Right? They see it's a scam. And so you have to bring your child up in the training and instruction of the Lord That is your responsibility to see that your child grows up this way. You teach your child. 
Does that mean that no child will wander from? No, I talked about that when we talked about Proverbs. But there is a responsibility, dads, that you have to be instilling in your children the truth of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's our job and responsibility, and we have to take it seriously. And here he's saying to them, because he understands how the world operates. Okay, talk about uh, here, 6, 5, and 8. He's now going to talk about in the household, husbands, wives, parents, and children, slaves, and masters. Okay, he says in 6, 5 through 8, Slaves, obey the masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling, in sincerity of your heart, as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men-pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the soul, serving with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good each person may do, this he will receive from the Lord, whether slave or free. Now, Christian slaves, he tells them there to serve their earthly master wholeheartedly, Because that service is part of Christian discipleship. It's part of their service to the Lord. That you have have this master and you are a Christian slave. And he says, what message you're to send to that master is, I don't know what happened to this slave. But when Christ came into his life, I've never seen a better slave. I've never seen a slave who is more responsible, more trustworthy, harder working, better. And who is this guy who affected him? And that's how it's to be with us in employment, by the way. And I know the difference between slavery and employment, although some of you may wonder about it. Okay? But, but it does apply there. You see? Christian employees are not to be the people who are running around stirring up strife, trying to kick back every chance they get. How does that reflect on Christ? People ought to want to say, I want to know who's a Christian, I'll hire him. Why? Because I've seen how Christians work. Right? And what does that do? That redounds to the glory of Jesus Christ. And so that's how we're to be, and he's telling these masters, these slaves, you are to do this because it's part of your service to the Lord. You're doing... You do this knowing that Christ rewards faithfulness, whether in a slave or a free man. Okay, you act this way because you understand that Christ rewards faithfulness. That's what he wants. So you be faithful in your circumstance. You be the best slave this guy's ever seen. Knowing that Christ rewards faithfulness, whether slave or free. Then he talks to the masters. Then he says, and masters... Do the same to them, giving up threatening, knowing that the master, both of them and you, is in heaven, and there's no favoritism with him. Okay, now here he talks to the slave owner. He talks here to the master. Christian masters are likewise to make their service of the one heavenly master determinative of their actions. What determines how I treat my slave? I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what determines how I treat my slave. They and the slaves they own are fellow slaves of Christ. Okay, this will keep them from abusing their slaves, won't it? It'll keep them from abusing their slaves, from treating them in a fashion, you know, that they wouldn't want to be treated. It'll keep them from that. O'Brien, he says, Christ's lordship over the lives of both slaves and masters has the effect of changing the dynamic of the relationship between them and lifting their mutual attitudes and behavior to a new plane. Now, let me say a little bit about slavery in the first century. This, I don't probably take, I got a little couple pages here I want to talk about. I think it's important because this whole idea of Christians and slaves and all this stuff, it's unsettling. Okay, it's unsettling. Part of the reason it's unsettling is we haven't thought through some of the things, and we don't really appreciate, I think, the nature of slavery in the first century. Now, slavery was a basic social institution in the ancient world. Okay, S. Scott Barchi, who's an expert, I mean, this is his world he plays in. He writes in the in Dictionary of the Later New Testament. I'm also going to have a lengthy quote from him from the Anchor Bible Dictionary. But he says, as many as one-third of the population of the empire were enslaved. 
as many as one-third of the population of the empire were enslaved, and an additional large percentage had been slaves earlier in their lives. Now, the Bible doesn't endorse or assume the goodness of slavery. It simply tolerates it. It takes slavery as a fact of life, and then it regulates people's involvement in it. See, unlike marriage, unlike the parent-child relationship, Scripture nowhere suggests that slavery was ordained or instituted by God. Slavery was a product of sinful humanity. You say, well, why do you think that? Well, you, one of the ways you can see this, it's evident from the fact that in 1 Corinthians 7.21, Paul says, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. He would never say such a thing, give that kind of advice to spouses or to parents and children. Okay, so this isn't something that's ordained or instituted by God. And in that regard, it's probably more than coincidental that from all indications, neither Jesus nor the apostles owned slaves. Okay, so what's going on here? Now, the seeds, the seeds for slavery's dissolution were sown in Scripture. Okay, you see texts like Philemon 16, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. You receive him back like that. Ephesians 6, 9, Colossians 4, 1, masters provide your slaves what is right and fair. 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 12, masters are brothers. Do you see that you have these seeds for slavery's dissolution in Scripture? And it's been said where these seeds of equality came to full flower. Or where they come to full flower, the very institution of slavery would no longer be slavery. If these seeds were given their full import, slavery wouldn't be slavery. It would be done away. How many of you saw the movie Amazing Grace? Okay, Amazing Grace with uh, William Wilberforce, 19th century England, an evangelical. Of course, they kind of underplayed his evangelicalism. They, they made it as though uh, he had to pick whether he wanted to go fight slavery or really be devoted to ministry kind of thing, uh, which isn't how he would put it. See, his opposition to slavery flows out of his commitment to Christ. And that's how it was. Now, the fact it took us so long to do that, that's simply a testimony to the dullness of Christians to the implications of the gospel. Okay, but the 19th century revolution that you saw, rooted in this kind of thing, those seeds coming to full flower. Now, the fact God didn't forbid Christians in the first century from owning slaves, but rather tolerated a regulated form of, of first century slavery, that doesn't mean that that was his ideal for mankind. Okay, the fact he tolerated a regulated form of first century slavery doesn't mean that was his ideal for mankind. His ideal is brotherhood and equality, but it's possible, right? It's possible that the world had gotten so warped and twisted that he was willing to tolerate less than his ideal as a concession to the hardness of men's hearts as he did with divorce... Remember, what does Jesus say in Matthew 19? That's not God's complete intention, but he was willing to allow it through Moses because of the hardness of your heart. So that's a possibility of what he's doing, is that it was a concession because things had gotten so twisted through the hardness of men's hearts. Or maybe he tolerated it because mandating the release of slaves in that social context, okay, if he just says, look, no, they all got to go. Mandating the release of slaves in that context, it's possible that would have caused anarchy and consequent suffering as the gospel exploded across the Roman world. In other words, maybe the slavery, the thorn of slavery, this is logically possible, maybe the thorn of slavery had to be removed slowly. See, perhaps society first needed to be altered under Christianity's influence to be able to, be able to handle such a change without overwhelming adverse side effects. It may be that the society, the world, it had to be changed because if you just mandated it as the gospel exploded, you'd have had anarchy. And the suffering that was consequent to that anarchy would have been terrible. Okay, so this is a possibility. Let me read to you what Dunn says. He says, slavery was an established fact of life in the ancient world. 
As many as one-third of the inhabitants of most large urban centers were slaves. The economies of the ancient world could not have functioned without slavery. Consequently, a responsible challenge to the practice of slavery would have required a complete reworking of the economic system and a complete rethinking of social structures, which was scarcely thinkable at the time except in idealistic or anarchic terms. Okay, so when I think about what is God doing in tolerating this thing that is so clearly less than the ideal is shown from the seeds that I see. Well, he's tolerating a regulated form of first century slavery for maybe because of the hardness of people's hearts, maybe because to mandate it, its, its rejection right then would have caused greater difficulties and problems because of how it had been so intertwined in the culture. Okay, but in all of that, I want you to understand the bell. Let me say one other thing. I'll, I'll talk about this next week. I want you to understand that the institution of slavery in the first century was vastly different than American slavery. Okay, I want you to know that so when you think about what I'm saying to you, you think about it with the knowledge that that slavery was nothing like the slavery in the New World. And I'll go through some of the differences when we get back next week. Thank you.